Hello, and thank you for joining the POCUS Certification Academy for today's POCUS Bytes webinar. I'm Tori, and I'll be your facilitator. We are now starting, so all lines have been muted. Please use the Q&A box for any questions or the chat box for comments you have throughout the webinar. Today's presentation will include a PowerPoint presentation, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers at the end. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment and invite you to visit our webinar page at www.pocus.org, where you can find all previously recorded webinars searchable by topic. I also invite you to attend our April webinar on Pocus in Global Health, occurring on April 15th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Additionally, the Pocus Certification Academy will be hosting the 2021 Pocus World Virtual Conference on, on September 17th and 18th. A call for presentations is open until April 12th, and attendee registration will be opening soon. Please visit our website for more details. Our presenter today is Dan Knapp. Dan became an RN in 1983. He worked in the OR, ICU, and ER settings for nine years prior to attending Texas Wesleyan Anesthesia Program, getting his CRNA credential in December 1994. He received his GNAP degree from Texas Wesleyan in 2012. He was in the first class for the Acute Surgical Pain Management Fellowship at Middle, Middle Tennessee School of Anesthesia, graduating in 2018. He serves as adjunct faculty for MTSA as a clinical site director and is co-owner of Maverick Medical Education. Maverick trains all types of healthcare professionals in the use of ultrasound technology for regional nerve blocks uh, for acute surgical pain control, chronic pain treatments, and point of care ultrasound for medical assessments and vascular access. Dan is passionate about the use of ultrasound and is dedicated to the education of all healthcare professionals. It's our pleasure to have you with us today. Take it away, Dan. Okay, thank you, Tori. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, fabulous. I'm going to share my screen here, and uh, we're going to get into a little bit of a chat about point of care ultrasound, um, and I think specifically a little bit. I'm going to take my uh, face off here. There we go. <clears throat> So uh, we're gonna talk about POCUS for nurses. And uh, it's interesting that POCUS or point of care ultrasound, which is basically just using ultrasound for, uh, let me, there we go. POCUS is the point of care use of ultrasound by a clinician. And that can be any clinician um, from, uh, from you know a, a floor nurse right there giving direct patient care all the way up to cardiologists. I mean, it's, it's a wide range of, of people that use POCUS. It's a diagnostic tool for procedural assistance in the evaluation and management of patients. So as we go through here, we'll see exactly what you can use it for. Uh, the characteristics of a POCUS exam, uh, you have a well-defined purpose uh, for using it to improve patient outcomes. It's typically very focused and goal oriented. The findings are easily recognizable. Um, it is easily learned, uh, which seems maybe counterintuitive because it seems like ultrasound is fairly complicated, but, but in reality, it's, it's not that complicated and it can be easily learned um, in a fairly short amount of time. It's quickly performed and it's performed at the bedside. So that's what the point of care aspect of POCUS delts with uh, the point of care um, ultrasound use for an exam. In the clinic, the ER, pre-op, up on the floor, uh, it can be anywhere in the hospital or, or in a clinic, uh, an outpatient clinic or doctor's office. So I found this was interesting. And if you look at the, at the dates here, it's uh, 2011, uh, 2007 uh, in the citations down below there. 2004. So the thought of POCUS has been around uh, since the late 1990s, really, but it's just now really kind of coming into its own. I think most people that are on this web webinar have probably just heard about POCUS uh, recently and are interested in it. So it's really growing fast. 
But I pulled a couple of highlights out of this uh, particular article that I ran across a few years ago. POCUS has the ability to save billions of dollars on an annual basis. I found that to be an interesting thought process because you can you can utilize POCUS and decrease a whole lot of other diagnostic modalities like CAT scans and chest x-rays and things like that. Um, you can You can avoid surgical procedures and various other costly um, medical out, output uh, for dollars by, by using POCUS. Uh, so I think that's what this is speaking to here. And uh, it, it has been called the stethoscope of the future, which, which is interesting because we, we've all used stethoscopes through our whole careers. But uh, what ultrasound gives you is a little bit deeper look into the body with a lot more information than a stethoscope uh, can give you. And then healthcare providers, facilities, and health systems that strategically incorporate POCUS into their clinical practice will rapidly distinguish, distinguish themselves from those who refrain from incorporated this highly valuable modality. And, and I would agree 100% with that. I think I think uh, if you don't get on the POCUS train now, you're going to be you're going to be left behind. And uh, those those people that that work towards that goal are are going to be ahead of those that don't. So I would say anybody who's on this webinar, uh, you're, you're making a, the right choice, in my opinion. So here's a little slide I ran across that kind of shows the uh, the timeline. Along the bottom, you see the timeline. Cardiology started using ultrasound uh, back in the 60s. And then of course, obstetrics in the 70s. And then really POCUS came about uh, in the 80s and 90s through our, our colleagues in the emergency room. The, the EFAST program, the focused assessment of uh, shock and trauma, and uh, really kind of started in the ER. And then our critical care colleagues and, and anesthesia kind of jumped on board with using ultrasound mainly through nerve blocks and things like that. But point of care ultrasound is coming much more in vogue in the anesthesia world, which is the world that I live in. Internal medicine, pediatrics, med students, um, many medical schools uh, during their white coast coat ceremony are handing out handheld ultrasound probes to their med students. Mid-level providers, um, which typically that means any advanced practice nurse, uh, whether it's CRNA, nurse practitioners, I think midwives are beginning to use uh, ultrasound clinical nurse specialists in the intensive care nurses, and then eventually all providers are going to start using POCUS. Uh, you can see 2020 is about the time that uh, ultrasound is really going to blow up for the next couple of decades. Uh, it's utilized for assessment. Here we can see just a little graphic showing where you can where you can use it to assess uh, patients, pulmonary, cardiac, abdominal, vascular access. We'll go into a little bit more of that here toward the end of the talk. Uh, but using it for IV starts is, is a great, great thing for for nurses um, on the floor, nurses in the intensive care unit and any, any provider throughout the hospital. I think you'll find that it's uh, pretty helpful in that area. So cardiac, um, this, this is just a little graphic showing what we would call the parasternal long axis view where you can see the ultrasound is looking through the chest and uh, looking at a cardiac window. This is the parasternal long axis cardiac window. And uh, what can you look for when you're looking uh, at this um, left ventricular and right ventricular function, volume status, wall motion abnormalities, valvular function, pericardial effusion, cardiac tamponade. Those are a little bit um, high level terms uh, from the diagnostic as aspect of, of medicine and cardiology. But what POCUS is, it's not a diagnostic tool, it's more of just an assessment tool. And I'll, I'll show a slide here in a, in a couple of slides from now that gives a great analogy 
uh, of, of what POCUS is. And you don't have to be a cardiologist uh, to understand and be able to see what normal looks like. And I'm going to just show you a little video here. This is basically a normal parasternal long axis view. And uh, this is showing many things. I don't know if you can see my uh, little hand here, but here's the aortic valve here. And this is the mitral valve. And what this view is showing us the anterior leaflet of this mitral valve is is slapping fairly quickly and almost reaching up here to the uh, septal wall between the right ventricle and the left ventricle and this is an indication of fairly decent left ventricular function and we can see the aortic valve here so this is a simple view that gives you lots of information and it's sort of like an ekg we as nurses, we look at EKGs all day long. We're not cardiologists, but we know what normal looks like and we know what abnormal looks like. And if we see abnormal uh, in our assessment of the patient, we call in um, an upper level, more upper level provider, uh, perhaps an internal medicine or a cardiologist. And uh, we call in the Calvary essentially. So if we can learn what normal looks like, and in this case, this is a fairly normal looking heart. Um, Abnormal would uh, would show up, and uh, it, it's fairly apparent when something is abnormal. And uh, we don't have to know what the abnormality is per se. We may have an idea of what it is, but we're gonna we're gonna kick that up the up the line uh, to a higher level of provider when we when we use ultrasound to look at the heart. Here's another view. This is the parasternal short axis. And this we're looking at, uh, this is the mitral valve here, and they, they call this the fish lips or fish mouth view, and uh, obviously for the reasons that it looks like a fish mouth. And uh, we're looking right through the mitral valve there, but this has given us a good look at ventricular function. We can see that the ventricle is kind of pumping concentrically and everything looks fairly good from this standpoint. So if you had concerns about a patient's heart and took a look at this, uh, it might allay your fears, or if it were abnormal, you would probably be able to tell fairly quickly that something was abnormal, and then you would uh, call in a, a higher level specialist. So uh, we can use point of care ultrasound, uh, to look at patients' abdomens. We can see aortic aneurysms. We can see liver masses or bleeding, particularly in the ER. When you get a, a car wreck victim that comes in, you can look in their abdomen and see if there's free fluid in there. And most likely that would be blood, uh, post-trauma. And, uh, you can, uh, you can get patients taken care of very quickly uh, in the ER after a, uh, an EFAST exam. And uh, I don't, in my days working in the ER, I can recall several instances where, where folks kind of did poorly in the CAT scanner. They were stable when they left. And then we went to the CAT scan and the CAT scan showed massive internal bleeding and the patient either bled to death in the CAT scan or, or did not fare well in the operating room because of lost, precious lost minutes. So POCUS uh, can really help get things underway quickly. You look at the gallbladder size and contents, uh, volume status, looking at the vena cava. This particular picture is showing the arrow at the, the, the vena cava, and it kind of gives you a ballpark uh, assessment of uh, a volume status. You can find kidney stones. You can look at the spleen, see if it's injured, if there's blood around it, things like that. So POCUS is, is very good <clears throat> for uh, finding those kind of things. This is another little video that shows some, some abnormalities. And uh, up the top left there, we can see that's abnormal. Now, this is a I believe that's an apical view. And you can see there's pericardial effusion around the outside of the heart. The heart's kind of swinging in the pericardial sac. And, and that's obviously fairly abnormal. The upper right one, we see a, a more dense pericardial effusion and that heart's having a hard time uh, functioning. So that's a cardiac tamponade. And the one down in the lower right, if you can see my little hand, this is the inferior vena cava. And you can see it's 
very engorged and uh, it's having a hard time emptying into this heart, which is having a hard time emptying in itself. So these are things you can see with point of care ultrasound that are, are very alarming and you would call in the Calvary. So here's an EKG. All nurses know uh, how to look at an EKG. Um, we have varying levels of sophistication for reading EKGs. Some, some folks are experts in 12 leads, but most of us can read an EKG strip and we can see that this person is in a sinus rhythm, um, most likely a tachycardia. Uh, looks like it's probably over 100. I'm, all the rules of reading EKGs, all the little boxes, you can calculate what this rate is. But I think we can all fairly, fairly confidently say that this person is in some sort of sinus rhythm. So we can make that assessment without being a cardiologist. So this analogy is similar to point of care ultrasound in that we can make an assessment with ultrasound and we can tell if something is normal or abnormal. And these are assessments we're making. We're not, we're not making diagnoses. We're making patient assessments, just like you would make with a, an EKG or using a stethoscope, listening to, to heart sounds, lung sounds, uh, abdominal sounds. Um, so that analogy, I think, um, holds true with point of care ultrasound. So how can we assess uh, lungs? We can look for interstitial fluid or pulmonary edema. We can uh, see what a plural, if there's a plural effusion, if there's a pneumothorax, uh, we can see lung consolidation. If maybe there's a, uh, a pneumonia or a lung mass. So we can see that uh, using ultrasound. And uh, here we see a chest X-ray in the background. <clears throat> and over here on the left side, you can see there's a large pneumothorax over here. Interestingly, the third bullet point, pneumothorax, a chest x-ray is only 76% sensitive, meaning that only 76% of the time do you find a true positive for a pneumothorax, whereas ultrasound sensitivity is, is 95 to 100%. I mean, if you, if you look with ultrasound and there is a pneumothorax, you will typically find it 95 to 100% of the time. So I found that statistic uh, to be very powerful um, in that uh, the use of, of ultrasound is, uh, is very helpful. And the lower right uh, graphic here uh, is a picture of, we're, we're using M mode and uh, the little dotted line going in between these two rib spaces is looking at the lung in the pleural interface and the, the left the little left picture here is the M mode that shows what we would call the stratosphere sign, meaning that underneath the probe in between these two rib spaces, there is probably a pneumothorax. And uh, that is 95 to 100% uh, sensitive. And, and that's a powerful thing. So, and it's very simple to learn this. Here we see uh, pulmonary edema on the left is normal lung. On the right is interstitial fluid. And uh, you can see these, these sort of uh, rocket tail artifacts. They're called B lines. And normally you should have three or less of these lines uh, within one rib space. And here we can see multiple, multiple B lines. And to me, this looks like, like if you're scuba diving and, you know, and you can see the sun shining through the water, the rays of the sun, or after a rainstorm, you can see the, the sun coming down through the clouds and, and the rays of the sun. That's what bee lines look like to me. So this is very indicative of interstitial fluid collection or pulmonary edema. And it's very easy to see. So if you were on the floor or in the intensive care unit or, or on a step down unit or in the ER and you had a patient that was short of breath, maybe had a history of uh, congestive heart failure, you could very quickly place a probe on their chest and see, oh, they have interstitial pulmonary fluid. And uh, you could uh, call in uh, 
a higher level provider to, to get them taken care of very quickly. You don't have to wait for a, a, a chest X-ray or a CAT scan and you can avoid ionizing radiation um, and you can make a bedside assessment immediately uh, with the ultrasound. And that, again, that's a very powerful thing for us. Here we see uh, a normal lung. Now, the little two-headed arrow line here is the, the pleural um, interface. And when someone is breathing, this is a static picture. When you're doing an ultrasound scan, it's a dynamic uh, event where the patient is breathing in and out and you can see the pleural lining slide back and forth. And that's called lung sliding. And I don't have a video of that uh, to show today, but it's fairly recognizable. And that's one way that we can rule in or rule out norm, uh, pneumothorax by looking at lung sliding. But then using the M mode, we can see on the left, this is called the seashore sign. So it looks like waves coming onto a beach and then the sandy beach below. And what that is in M mode, it's showing that there's movement between two layers of tissue. You have the visceral and the pleuridal pleura moving against one another. And that shows uh, like this seashore sign. If you have a pneumothorax and the viral and the pleural and visceral pleura are, are not rubbing together, you get no chest wall motion and you have no lung motion uh, sliding over the, the pleural edges. And that is called the barcode code or stratosphere sign. And it's very, very distinguishable. And you can rule in and rule out a pneumothorax fairly quickly uh, using ultrasound. A uh, DVT assessment. Here on this picture, we can see the artery above that's very uh, blue and, and got the yellow. And that just shows movement through the, the vessel. And there's no blood movement through the, the vein below. And I think you can kind of see a, a clot uh, thrombus inside that vein that's below that artery. And so that's one thing. Uh, you got people that come in with uh, leg pain, uh, redness, swelling. Uh, maybe they are they come in with shortness of breath and they're a little tachycardic and you're concerned maybe they've thrown a PE. You can look at their large uh, vessels in their legs, the large veins, and see if they have deep vein thrombosis. Here's a little video here uh, that I'm gonna show. And, and the little highlight here, the little blue box, 103 pulmonary embolisms occur every hour in the, in the USA. And that is from a Sonocin module. Uh, Sonocin's a great online company that you can, uh, you can learn point of care ultrasound through. Uh, and, whoop, I've done something wrong here. There we go. If you look at this video, you can see this thrombus kind of flopping in the middle of that uh, common femoral vein. And you'll often see thrombi collect where there's a, a tributary. Uh, you can see the common femoral vein here turning into the uh, superficial and deep. So when, when you have a uh, sort of a Y in the road, you get turbulent blood flow and that's where clots kind of like to, to build. So it's just one more assessment that you can make of your patient. Now, ultrasound for vascular access. This is really, really exciting for nurses. I work in, uh, in the operating room and we have patients come in through, through outpatient setting. And uh, the first major anxiety for both the patient and the nursing staff is getting that IV in. Uh, it's just a major a major anxiety hurdle for, for both parties to get over. Because uh, as nurses, we never want to stick anyone more than once. And oftentimes we have to. Preoperatively, our patients are, are NPO, so they're, they're a little bit dry volume status-wise, so their veins aren't poking out. They're nervous, which makes your veins kind of hide. Um, so it can be difficult to, to get a peripheral IV in someone. Um, so if you can learn how to use the ultrasound, you can, uh, you can decrease your failure rate. And there's some pretty good studies out here. We'll, I'll show a little slide here in a little bit that has some studies. And you can Google and, uh, and look through the, the various search websites and find all of these studies. But 
they, uh, through the use of an IV team, an IV start team in hospitals, they've decreased the chance of needing a second stick to like, uh, well, it's a 96% success rate many times. So they go from like a 70% first first stick success rate to 96% when you use ultrasound. And again, a very powerful thing, I think, to help our patients and to help ourselves to avoid all that anxiety. So this is just a couple of screenshots of, of a whole bunch of uh, evidence that's out there. Ultras ultrasonography guided peripheral IV access versus traditional approaches. Um, randomized controlled trial of ultrasound peripheral catheter placement versus traditional. All of these studies are out there and they, you know, they stem from 1999 all the way up to uh, 2016. And, and of course there's more and more, more uh, current research out there on the books that you can look into. So uh, the take home message from the evidence of using um, ultrasound for IV guidance is it increases your success rates. And there's lots of evidence out there that shows that less needle sticks, less second and third attempts, less inadvertent arterial sticks. Um, and uh, when you're starting IV, sometimes there's, uh, there's arteries around that you can get into and cause hematomas. And if you're doing an arterial line, certainly using an ultrasound will increase your success rate on that first stick. Uh, I know <clears throat> from experience, um, if you miss that first stick and you get a, a hematoma there at the radial, radial artery in the wrist, it makes the second, third stick much harder to be successful at. So if you use ultrasound, you'll pretty much get it the first stick every time. Uh, it's going to be cost and time saving. You use less catheters and supplies if you can get that IV in the first time. And then you can decrease the need for central lines, which is a safety factor because central lines are, are not benign. Anytime you, you poke a needle and put a catheter in a large vessel, there's chances of stenosis and thrombus and infection. So if you can, if you can get a, uh, a midline, and we'll talk about that here in a bit, and not have to do a central line, that's helpful. So here's a little graphic that shows all the kind of the major veins in the arm. And a lot of times, if you look above the antecubital fossa here along uh, the route of the humerus, there's three large veins that run through there that are easily identifiable with ultrasound. And that's the cephalic vein anteriorly, and then the, the brachial and the basilic vein, uh, kind of medially here. Uh, the basilic vein is my favorite because it's there's no artery around it. The, the brachial vein has an artery and the median nerve runs fairly close to the brachial vein. So my favorite is this large basilic vein and, and it's very easily seen uh, on, on almost everyone. And then there's also large veins uh, that are deep in the forearm here. The, the problem, with if, if you can't feel veins in the arm, the, the traditional way of starting IVs uh, is very difficult, but you can always see veins uh, with ultrasound. And uh, we'll look at a couple of, of videos here to show what veins look like. So here's the typical way you would start an IV uh, using ultrasound. You'd get all your stuff laid out and uh, you want to be ergonomically set up so that you can see the ultrasound screens across here at the very top of the screen. And you would be, you would put the probe on their arm and look right across the screen and, and look for a vein. And they've got all their IV catheters laid out here. Everything you need, uh, preparation is the key. Various implements that you need to start IVs. Um, a linear high frequency probe is gonna give you better resolution. High frequencies, they don't see deep, they, they see superficially, but they give you a very high definition and you have a very, very good view of the anatomy. And uh, typically uh, you will use a linear high frequency probe, the higher the frequency, the better for putting superficial veins in or IVs in veins. You're going to need a sterile sleeve and you're going to need gloves and you're going to need to maintain asepsis. Uh, you don't want to cross contaminate uh, patients with the probe and you want to protect your probe also from blood and, and uh, the gel and all that stuff. 
So uh, this is just a static uh, shot of a screen and you can see this vein in the very center. It's a very shallow vein. Most ultrasound machines will have a, a choice for a center line. And if you align that center line up with the vein and line the center of the, let me go back one here and see if it shows. Yeah, it doesn't show on this probe. Usually there's a, a center line on the probe right there. Here on this one, it shows probe indicators on, on the left side, but this little center line shows the center of the probe. So if you line the center of the probe over the center of the screen and put the vein in the center of the screen through the center line, your IV needle is gonna come right down on that vein. So it takes the guesswork out of the left, right, um, and it also takes the guesswork out of the depth over here. You can see uh, how deep that is going to be. And this really, really increases your chances of success. So this is a little video that shows what a vein looks like. And you can see it winking at you. When you, when you compress, veins are easily compressible. And uh, you can see that it, it's, it's pretty simple to identify that structure as a vein. That again, it almost looks like, well, that's probably not a vein there next to it, but it's pretty obvious that this, this big juicy thing in the middle is a, is a vein. So there's two views for vessels. You got a short axis, which is where you're looking at the cross section of the vein, the vein is looking at you. It's coming through the screen at you. And then the long axis is looking along the long axis of the vein. So the vein is lying kind of sideways in front of you and you're looking at the, the long view of the vein. And here is a video of the needle coming down. This is a gel phantom that we use in our training uh, to help learn how to keep an eye on your needle and put it into the middle of the vein. And you'll be able to see here that the needle coming in, you can just see the very tip when you're coming out of plane, you can only see the tip of the needle. So you, you will learn to kind of walk your beam along to keep that needle tip in view. And here we can see the, the needle entering the center of the vein. Now you would, you would get blood return right here. So that, that would tell you that you are now in the middle of that vein. So the next move that I would make, I would turn my probe 90 degrees and look at this longitudinal view. And this is kind of what, what you're seeing from the longitudinal view. Now that's your needle in the middle of that vein. And now you can adjust your needle and uh, drive it into that vein and slide your catheter off and uh, there are a lot of kits that have J wires in. If you have a J wire, that's real helpful because you can you can run that little feeder wire into the vessel. You can see the needle coming out. Now the catheter is left in the vein. These gel phantoms aren't quite as forgiving as uh, tissue, but you can see that catheter sliding right into that gel phantom. So this is the kind of training that that you need to sort of master this technique. And after you do that, you know. 20, 30 times, uh, you become pretty facile at it and, uh, and get, it gets your confidence up and uh, boost your success rate for sure. So brings us into the next forum here. How should we learn this new assessment strategy? Well, we can go to the evidence for that. And uh, this is some interesting information. Uh, these are some, uh, some doctors that are, that are into education and learning and and this is taken out of this uh this particular piece of evidence here what they're talking about how our, our duty hour restrictions were so busy that we have a reduced amount of time uh to teach and absorb the sheer volume of material that that is being thrown at us so we need a time efficient way to learn that makes our lessons stickier, which I thought that was an interesting way of saying it. You need that. You need to be able to efficiently learn this stuff and make it stick in your head. 
And uh, they've come up with this flipped classroom approach, which is extremely helpful uh, when you're learning something that is task oriented, like ultrasound. Uh, when you're doing ultrasound, you're, you're doing a task. You're using an ultrasound probe and a machine and, and you're, you're taking a three dimensional occurrence and you're looking at it in a two dimensional screen. And that takes practice, hand eye coordination, uh, muscle memory, and uh, a term called neuroplasticity, which just means that your brain learns, learns new things. So your brain figures out what that feels like and what that looks like. And when you do that multiple times, it's like riding a bike. You pretty much, you pretty much learn it. And when you leave your practice session or your, your course that you've learned um, point of care ultrasound, whether you're using it for IVs or nerve blocks or looking at the, the heart or the lungs, um, it is a learned task oriented procedure and you need practice with that. So can you teach yourself point of care ultrasound to a level of clinical competency? This is a, a article out of from 2018 and, uh, Basically, what they concluded, they, they were unable to demonstrate the achievement of competence in POCUS uh, in a self-directed uh, way. Now, that doesn't mean that that is true for everyone, but overall, I think most people learn better if they have someone there that's an expert helping them. So you need feedback from faculty, curriculum integration aligned with clinical experience, uh, or practice, uh, practice under the, the watchful eye of an expert keeps you from making the same mistake over and over again and uh, sort of decreases the learning curve. This is an interesting society that I'm a, a member of, uh, and it's just all things ultrasound. This, this website just throws stuff at you. You got to have a lot of time to read it all, but it, it's fascinating. And, and these folks are very passionate about, uh, about teaching. And it says, although there's no specific number of clinical ultrasound scans that can guarantee individual competence, uh, they recommend that each clinician perform about 25 exams of each application. So 25 heart exams, 25 lung exams, 25 abdomen exams, gallbladder, uh, what, what have you, uh, which is like a minimum of 150 to 300 scans. Now, that's over time, you're going to get that many. You can't really get that in a, in a, a day course or a, or a weekend course, but certainly you can, in a, in a weekend course, I know what our experience with Maverick is that uh, you can do 30 to 40 scans in a day and really kind of get the feel of it. You can really kind of get up on that bicycle and learn what it feels like uh, to get that, uh, to get that feel and, and what all that stuff looks like. So uh, what does that tell you about what kind of a training program uh, is, is gonna be helpful for you? There's a lot of YouTube videos out there. YouTube is a wonderful thing and you can look at all this stuff and uh, you, know, you can learn everything you need to learn and then you can grab a ultrasound uh, machine and just start scanning people. And that's one way to learn. The problem with that is that uh, you don't know if you're making any mistakes and you may be doing the wrong thing over and over and over again and, and not figure out why it's not looking like you want it to look. The flipped classroom, a little bit of evidence that I gave earlier that shows how we can more efficiently make all this stuff stickier in our brains and uh, get that neuroplasticity that we're looking for is very helpful in decreasing the learning curve and increasing the efficiency of learning this. And what that is in, in this modern age, the flipped classroom is you sign up for, for something and you take online modules. And those modules give you all the didactic information. You're not, you're not in front of a screen getting uh, death by PowerPoint. If you have 50 people in a classroom and you show them a hundred PowerPoint slides over uh, an hour or two hour learning session, um, people become quickly mind numbed and uh, not everyone learns the same. If you're giving them five to 10 seconds per slide, it's almost impossible for those people to soak 
that uh, information into their brain. And then, then if you unleash them on a, uh, a handheld or, or a hands-on lab, uh, they're already tired. And, uh, you know, if they've had lunch and they're a little bit sleepy by the time they get to the lab, their, their brains are kind of overwhelmed in, in that one day setting. So what we found is the flipped classroom helps with that. So uh, if you deliver the content online in short bite-sized pieces where folks can learn it um, in 20 to 30 minute sessions and, and then take a break and you know go play fetch with their dog or, or play with their children and then come back and take another module, you can learn it and you can go back and you can repeat it over and over again. And then when you show up at the hand hands-on lab, you, you know what you're supposed to be doing, you know what it's supposed to look like, and now you have all day long with, a, uh, with someone to practice. So the step-by-step uh, -step knowledge, skills, and practice paradigm uh, is important in, in decreasing the learning curve and, and making this learning stickier, as the, that one piece of evidence talked about. Hands-on skills lab with experts and experienced in the field will will give you pointers or pearls of, of what to do if you're not if you're not seeing what you want to see or you're having a difficult time getting a uh, an IV catheter into a vein or into a gel phantom having someone there that that is an expert and is experienced in the field will will help get you up and running a whole lot faster and it decreases your uh, your learning curve it increases the efficiency of your learning so the ability to practice those skills and have 25 to 30 repetitions or more of, of this hands-on skill that you're learning is extremely, extremely uh, helpful. So there are, there are all kinds of programs out there. And of course, the one I'm more familiar with is, is Maverick Medical Education. That is my company. Um, that uh, I am part owner with uh, another CRNA named David Gaskin. And uh, we teach ultrasound guided nerve blocks. We teach chronic nerve pain injections. We teach vascular access. We teach point of care, ultrasound POCUS. Uh, we have courses for all of those entities. And, and we use this flip classroom uh, technique. We partnered with uh, some uh, PhD doctors of education through uh, uh, Texas A&M University down College Station, Texas, who helped us develop our online modules and kind of develop our hands-on courses to be the most efficient way of learning this stuff. So, and uh, there's just some references here. And I think that's the end of my talk. And I think Tori's going to come back and see if there's some questions we can Fantastic. Thank you, Dan. That was great. Great presentation. Great information. Uh, really appreciate you being here today. We do have uh, some questions that have come in. We'll get to those. Uh, for the attendees, if you have questions from the presentation today, please um, drop them into the, the Q&A box. You can find that box at the bottom of, the, of your screen. Uh, click on that Q&A button and it'll pop up a box. You can put your question in there and we'll get to those. Um, the first question, so let's jump right into those, Dan. The first question that came in um, was, uh, can you explain more on venous access in children and specifically pediatric populations between ages zero and five? Well, I don't have a whole lot of experience with pediatrics, um, but just empirically from what I know is if you, if you use an ultrasound, you're going to be able to see larger vessels that are beneath the surface of the skin. So I know, I do know it's difficult getting IVs in children and uh, most uh, like neonatal ICU nurses are magicians getting IVs and they're, they're very skilled in that. But I can imagine after a while there, there's some problems. So I would think um, children are, very small human beings and their vessels are going to be very small, but they're still going to have deeper vessels. So using ultrasound, uh, you'd have to get a very small probe, a uh, very high frequency probe, but I think I could see a utility for that. Um, so the extent of my experience with pediatrics is, is not great. I mean, I, I did a lot of PD in, 
in anesthesia, uh, healthy PD, like uh, ear tubes, um, tonsillectomies, things like that. Um, I've never worked in pediatric hearts or anything like that. Uh, we did some pyloroplasties and things like that. But uh, I do know it's difficult getting IVs in children. And I, I can only imagine ultrasound would be helpful in that venue. Great, great. Okay, no, another question that came in. How do you think AI can contribute to using POCA? Well, you know, AI is, is developing like everything else. It's, it's on fire. I mean, it's coming at us fast and furious and, and it's getting more and more sophisticated. So I would think AI would be able to sort of give you differential diagnoses of where to go. If, if uh, I, I can imagine with ultrasound, you know, there may be some, some form of overlay computer overlay that will help you navigate through, through the, uh, the anatomy as you move along. But uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not an expert in, in AI. I, I just know how to use ultrasound, but you know, everything's possible and, and AI is coming, you know, computers are smart and they can help us. They can crunch a lot of numbers. I know they're, they're using a lot of, I guess you would call it AI for, uh, using robotic, uh, surgical assistance. I know with our total knees and total hips, they're using a lot of that. And, uh, I suppose that would be, uh, qualified as AI, but, uh, I don't have a whole lot of expertise in that, but I, I could see that coming for sure. Yeah, great, great. Okay, another one uh, has come in. Why would a clinician choose ultrasound for vascular access versus a near infrared vein finder? Well, you can see the vein. A near infrared vein finder is going to show you where the vein is. It's not going to tell you the depth, and it's not going to give you that cross-sectional view. You can you can actually see depth on the ultrasound machine. So I've seen those infrared vein finders and, and they are very helpful to find veins and it sure removes the left right guesswork uh, of whether or not you're over the vein as you advance your needle in, but it doesn't help you with depth and it doesn't give you that, <clears throat> that longitudinal view of the vessel where you can see the the needle and the catheter actually entering the center of the vein. So, you know, you're not back walled or, you know, you've gone far enough to get through the anterior wall. So that would be one advantage ultrasound gives you over that. And, uh, you know, you can use them both. You can look with the infrared, find a vein, stick your probe on there, find the depth, guide your needle into the vessel and, and uh, increase your success rate. So that would be my take on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, great. Another question has come in. Thank you, attendees, for, for filtering in questions. We appreciate that. Uh, your next question, uh, is, is, it an, is it enough a year of training in ultrasound to complete a fellow of focus to ana analyze uh, transesophagic echocardiography? That's something... Uh... You know, it's, it's all going to depend on how adaptable the, the person is in picking that up. I know the point of care ultrasound certificate Academy, you guys have all kinds of certificates that people can take. Mm -hmm. when, when we developed our POCUS program, we went on uh, your website and for instance, the cardiac certification, we wrote our modules to answer the questions or to give the information that the, the POCUS Academy cardiac certification says you needed to know. So um, that's something that I think there are, there's probably fellowships out there that you can, that you can get in. POCUS is, uh, there's, there's a wide range of sophistication with POCUS. And obviously it goes from, from, you know, floor nurses just using it for, for IV access or maybe, you know, looking at lungs for pulmonary edema all the way up to cardiologists that do uh, echocardiograms and an echocardiograph 
technicians that that we hire for our for our our POCUS classes and that helped us write our modules. So there's there's a wide range of sophistication within the POCUS realm. Um, I can't answer the question of how long it would take, but I know the the POCUS Academy has certifications that you can sit for and you can take assessments for. And then I think they have um, recommendations of how many cases you need to look at. You really are going to have to, you're going to have to look at, at pathologies and be able to recognize pathologies if you're going to consider yourself fellowship trained. And that's something that's beyond the realm of what we teach. Our POCUS courses are introductory POCUS courses. It's sort of just to kind of wet your whistle with POCUS and get you excited about it and get you learning the basics. And then there's all kinds of higher levels of sophistication. I know John Shields through MTSA teaches a TEE course and a trans uh, thoracic echocardiograph course through MTSA that is very deep and, and very specific and, and you can learn a whole lot. Uh, yeah. That, from yeah that and you know, Dan, John, John is on the line and he has messaged me. He's, he's available to, um, uh, if you'd like, he, I can bring him off mute if you'd like, and he can, sure. uh, yeah, uh, okay. Let John, talk. John, 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 uh, John, bear with me here. I got to find you on my list and, and open up your, uh, okay. Allow to talk. Okay. John, you should, you should be, uh, you should be live. If you hit your mute button, come off mute. Yeah, there we go. Okay. How are we, how are we doing? Can you hear me? Hi, thanks, John. Yeah, you bet. We can hear you. So, so just briefly, uh, Dr. Sony, who, wrote a very nice textbook, had a very nice article in the Journal of Hospital Medicine about uh, certification, extramural certification versus intramural. As long as we teach it in our programs, in our curriculum, TE, that's just like the ER physician saying, that's our scope of practice because we teach it in our specialty. Uh, that said, you're not going to get certified anywhere in TE because the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesia and the ASA and the ASC have their thumb on it. So you're just going to get credentialed to your local hospital. So I recommend you go to maybe maybe one of Dan's courses and get some certificate completion or one of, of my courses or whatever. And that's probably the best you're going to do, at least for the next couple of years. Yeah, that's wise advice. Yeah. Yeah, the hospital, CRNAs are doing TE in all sorts of hospitals. They're not certified, but the hospital credentials them. And that's the best you're going to do right now as far as billing goes. I think there's a 93312 code that Mark Ritter up in Bowling Green uses for monitoring. And then he partners with a cardiologist to, to bill for a 93328. I think that's got interpretation as well. It's like $330 or something like that. Okay. John, thanks for coming off the mute and uh, assisting with that question. We do, we do appreciate that. Sure thing. Um, sure thing. Uh, let's see. So we do have another question that had come in. Um, what do you think, and then some of this might be um, for me as well, what do you think would be the best way to get certified for POCUS if we do not have a structured pathway for advanced providers? So I, I, I will turn that over to you, Dan, in just a moment. I, I, just Dan referenced, for, for all of you attendees, Dan referenced the POCUS Certification Academy, and on our website, POCUS.org, we do have a variety of certifications and certificates that are available. So I would just encourage you to, depending on which specialty you're looking at, just go ahead and uh, get to our website, uh, click on the certification tab, and that will bring up a list of everything that we have available. Uh, and then there is certainly, uh, if you have questions on that, we have a, uh, an email inbox that's just focus at intellius.org that you can email us and ask us questions. Um, Dan, would you, you can certainly add to that if you, um, well, if you have a thought there. Yeah, that, that's a great question, and and that's that's kind of what we're, we're we're trying to do with the 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 POCUS Academy. I know there are they have several PEP providers, which are preferred education providers, and I think there's a certain level of sophistication that that each of those providers um, provides. Our course with Maverick is is an introductory course that's going to teach you the basics of, you know, a, a lot of people have never held an ultrasound probe in their hand. So, you know, you want to learn to walk before you can run. And I think uh, there are programs out there that are much more technical uh, and in-depth than, than our program. Our program will get you up and running and teach you which end of the probe to look at and 
and kind of what normal looks like and, and kind of how to get your feet underneath you. And then there's other programs. I know John teaches much more in depth uh, cardiac stuff with his transthoracic and his TEE stuff. So TEE is going to be much more relegated to cardiology and whether it's interop for, for uh, CRNAs doing cardiac surgery, uh, that's very in-depth and, and uh, it, it's much more sophisticated than just using it for a, a introductory assessment tool. And then of course, vascular access um, can be taught uh, fairly fairly quickly and easily, but the level of sophistication uh, knows no bounds and it's gonna get more and more technical as time goes on. The other interesting thing I'd like to say is POCUS is really coming into vogue because of the, the advancement of technology. The ultrasound machines are getting better, they're getting smaller, they're getting more affordable. There's a wide variety of handheld devices now. Um, there's uh, the IQ Butterfly, the Lumify, uh, Clarius has some handheld things that you can use your iPhone or an iPad uh, as your screen and you can hook these handheld probes up and do bedside assessment. Um, and, and the picture quality is really, really quite good for the price. You can get an IQ Butterfly for about $3,000 and have a lifetime subscription to their um, cloud-based um, capture. You can capture images and keep them in, in your own proprietary folders and files. And uh, it's really fantastic. I know the Lumify is really good. The Clarius uh, comes highly recommended. Sauna Care. Or, I don't know, there's all kinds of handheld stuff out there. So as time goes on <clears throat> and the, the technology improves, uh, what we found is the technology has sort of overrun the teaching right now. So we're, we're trying to catch up with instruction on how to use this technology, which is really fabulous and, and is readily available for, for anyone um, that can kind of afford to buy your own now, if you're, if you're that interested in it. So, uh, right. so and the POCUS Academy will, will help you uh, kind of narrow down your, your likes and dislikes and, and, give, you, and, and give you references to, to move on. You can, you can learn the basics and then go on to however sophisticated you really want to get with this. It's an exciting field. Yeah. POCUS is very exciting. I could, I could not agree more with you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, well, everyone, thank you for your attendance today. That is that is all the time that we have. Dan, again, thank you. We appreciate you being here. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. You bet. All right, everyone, that wraps up our session for today. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the POCUS.org website in approximately one week. For more POCUS talk, check out our POCUS on POCUS podcast, POCUS blog post, and of course, follow us on social media where we post regular POCUS clinical challenges. Thank you for attending our webinar today, and we look forward to seeing you on a future webinar.